In this how-to series, we are going to go through the basic usage of Zenject in your Unity projects, starting with the basics and moving on to more advanced topics in later episodes. A general overview of the series. In part 1, we are going to cover downloading, installing Zenject and getting set up in Unity. In part 2, we will work through the Hello World example from the Zenject documentation, which will give us a good introduction. In parts 3 to 5, we are going to take a deeper dive into injection, binding and installers. In part 6, we're going to look at using Zenject in non mono behavior classes. And finally, in part 7, we're going to learn how to use factories to bind dynamically created objects. Additionally, I'll be using Unity 2019.1.14 in this series, although the Unity version you use is not really that important. All the codes and examples we work through in the series will be available on the series GitHub, a link to which is in the description. Zenject is a dependency injection framework built specifically to target Unity 3D. The project is open source and I've included links to the project GitHub and documentation in the description. Zenject is awesomely powerful but I found it to have a steep learning curve, especially if you are not familiar with dependency injection in general. In the first video I want to provide a basic overview of how dependency injection works and discuss why we would want to use it in our Unity projects. So what is dependency injection? A dependency is any time that a module in our project requires another module to function. For example, in order to function properly, class A may need to call a method in class B. In this case we say that A is dependent on B. In reality it's never that simple and we usually have massive dependency trees in our project, which can be difficult to manage and maintain. Dependency injection is a pattern where a separate module or framework is used to manage all these dependencies for us. Dependency injection applies mainly to the D in the solid design principles, dependency inversion, although it helps us in other areas too. Classes and all modules in our project should focus only on their own function, which also feeds into separation concerns. Our classes should not focus on the creation and configuration of classes they depend on. In the previous example, class A should not know how to construct class B. Finally, Classes should really depend on an abstraction, not a concrete implementation of their dependencies. For example, class A should depend on an interface that class B implements, rather than class B itself. Dependency injection has a few main objectives. It removes the requirement that a class has to know how to construct and configure its dependence. This makes the project loosely coupled, with our classes not directly depending on each other. It also enforces other solid design principles, such as single responsibility, dependency inversion and substitutability, where classes should be interchangeable with any of their subtypes. There are lots of advantages when using dependency injection in our projects and I think the key ones for me are the modularity that dependency injection enforces, with clear separation of concerns established between modular components. Along with modularity, structuring a project to use DI also improves the testability of the projects as we have isolated all of the individual units of functionality. Now I should probably say that dependency injection is not strictly necessary to provide these benefits and you can easily structure a software project differently to the same ends. However, they are more like emergent behaviours that come from using DI. In the next slides we are going to go through a simple thought experiment project where we are refactoring an existing save and load UI. This UI has been built as a basic prototype. It has two prefabs, each with its own mono behaviour class attached. Save UI allows the player to save their game. They enter the name for the save and click a button. When the button is clicked, the current state of their game is serialized into text and written to a save file. The load UI lists all the save files in a directory, allowing the user to select one and click load. When the user clicks load, the contents of the file is deserialized and the state of the game is restored using the data. Now you may have already seen that there's some duplication happening here. Both classes interact with serialization and deserialization of save files, and both classes interact with the file system of our target platform at a lower level. We start our refactoring, and the first thing we do is split the project up into four classes. Two mono behavior derived ones that control the save and load UI. A save file utility that implements serialization and deserialization of save files specifically, and a file utility which deals with low level operations such as reading, writing and listing files. We also have the beginnings of our dependency tree. The save and load UI classes both depend on the save file utility class, which itself depends on the file utility class. 
The UI classes create new instances of save file utility, which creates a new instance of file utility. In this configuration, we have separated out the functionality, but the classes are still highly interdependent. The UI class needs to know how to construct and configure the save file utility class, and that needs to know how to construct the file utility. So in comes the dependency injection framework. In this series, we are using Zenjex, but we'll keep it generic here. We are using the framework to manage the construction of our objects. This has removed the requirement that the UI classes need to know how to construct a save file utility class and so on. The next step is injection, where the objects we have constructed are passed into the objects that need them. Dependencies are injected in order. In this case, the file utility is injected into the save file utility, and then this is injected into the two UI classes. Injection can happen in a number of ways. In this example, we are using constructor injection, where the constructor of each class takes its dependent object as parameters. By analyzing the parameters the constructor has, the framework can generate a dependency tree or graph, which it then traverses to ensure everything gets constructed and injected in the correct order. So then things get more complicated, as they always do. Our game needs to target multiple platforms, which have different requirements for interacting with the file system. In order to target multiple platforms, we need a way to swap out the concrete implementation of the file utility that gets constructed and injected. This brings us to interfaces. Every class that we want to create and bind via the DI framework now has an interface defining its members. In our example, the iFileUtility interface defines the members that any implementation the file utility needs to provide. We then have one or more concrete implementations of the file utility, in our case one for PC, and a new one for PS4. What we can now do is have the save file utility depend on the interface I file utility, not a concrete implementation. This allows us to instruct the DI framework to construct a concrete implementation that should be provided to any dependent object in a process called binding. When binding, the interface tells the framework what type of object we want to bind and the implementation we want to actually use. In our example, we can bind either the PC or PS4 file utility to the iFile utility object, as both of these implement the interface. Any classes that depend on iFile utility depend on the interface, not on the concrete implementation, and therefore don't know or care how that interface is actually implemented. The implementation we bind to iFile utility could even be a mock test object, which becomes really powerful for testing our individual classes. So the framework has done its job, and we can see that we have the same structure as before. An important difference, however, is that none of these objects need to know anything about the inner workings of each other. As we just touched on, because interfaces are used to define the methods and properties that our concrete implementation should provide, we can use a mocking framework while testing. While not directly related to dependency injection, as a nice side effect of writing dependency injected code, we are writing code that is more modular and therefore more testable. In this example from another project, instead of binding a concrete implementation, we are binding a mock object. The mock object is set up to return true whenever file exist is called. The class and method we are testing, program utilities, calls file exist in the execution path for the get latest version path method. Because we have a mock object now, we can explicitly define what values are returned. This allows us to test the program utilities class using whatever fake data we want, valid or invalid, and even throw exceptions and other curveballs at it. To ensure that it's able to gracefully handle the unexpected. So in conclusion to this introductory episode, we've seen a few ways that using dependency injection gives us advantages while writing our games. In refactoring our save load UI thought experiment to use dependency injection, we have created clear separation of concerns in the classes. The UI classes deal with UI, the file utility class deals with low level file system operations, and the save utility class deals with save file specific operations. We've made the program more modular, using interfaces bound to concrete implementations. We can change how a module is implemented in isolation as long as it implements the interface. We can dynamically decide what implementation for an interface we want to use, whether at build time or even at runtime. We can also have individual developers working on the implementation of different modules without interdependency, as long as the interfaces are honored. As a nice side effect, we have also made the program more testable using mocking frameworks. Thanks for watching guys. To support the channel and help me make more videos, please like, comment and subscribe.